I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles, please, to the book of Matthew, chapter 7. Matthew, chapter 7. Matthew 7, and let's begin at verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Also, Mark 1.22 states, And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority, and not as the scribes. And Luke 4.32 says, They were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. I call this sermon today, Jesus versus Modern Scholarship. Jesus versus modern scholarship. When the Lord Jesus <clears throat> walked from city to city, town to town, teaching the multitudes, he commanded the attention of thousands of people, each of them hanging on every word that he uttered. When he read the scriptures in the synagogue, John, or, or Luke chapter 4, and then he made comment on them, we read, and all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. In John 6, he asked his disciples, will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. John 6, verses 67 and 68. The Jews sent <clears throat> officers to arrest and apprehend Jesus, but they came back empty-handed. And when they asked, why have you not brought him? The officers replied, never man spake like this man. John seven forty six. Both the scriptures, those things recorded and written down, and the Lord Jesus himself are both referred to as the Word of God in the Bible. As Bible believers, we believe in one true Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says so. And we don't believe in, in Jesus who has been sort of relegated to a secondary position after the Virgin Mary by the Catholic Church, or someone whose image has been redefined or rewritten by the cults or by some New Age group. And we also believe in one true and perfect Bible. We don't believe in comparing multiple versions to find the truth any more than we believe in trusting multiple saviors. I don't know why that's difficult for some people, but it seems to be. He is our Lord, and He's our ultimate authority, and we believe that His revelation is complete and without error and found in this book, the King James Bible, the authorized version. Christ prayed, Matthew 11, verse 25, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes, common man. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Doesn't it make some logical sense that if God was going to give the world a divine revelation of himself in a book, that that book should be as accessible to as many people as possible. Young, old, rich, poor, educated, uneducated. 
If you want to buy um, NIV, you're free to do so. But you're going to go to a Christian bookstore, you're going to uh, pay about 35 to 45, 50 bucks for a copy of it. Or you can go to the Dollar Tree store, 99 cent store, and find a King James Bible without any trouble. And uh, doesn't it seem logical that that book should be able to stand on its own without being weighted down with multiple footnotes and explanations and reference notes uh, at the bottom of the page by the uh, so-called experts? Read it, believe it, and trust the Holy Spirit to teach it to you as you go. Let me offer to you, to you six challenges leveled against the Bible um, and see how the Lord Jesus viewed each one of these six challenges. I'll give the alleged problems first. And uh, so if you're taking notes, put some space between each heading. And then you go back and write the reference or the answers to them as we uh, come back to it. And problem number one, that is Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Chapter 1 narrates the creation week and concludes in, in chapter 1, verse 27, saying, Male and female created he them. But chapter 2 describes the man being created separately from the woman until God saw that he needed a wife. And he took one of the ribs out of his side and made one for him. And the scholars have thus concluded that both of these stories are so different that they, most, that they both, both must be uh, figurative, allegorical. And you don't have to believe either one of them literally. Problem number two. The authorship of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah has 66 chapters, just as our Bible has 66 books in it. And there's a, a clear and a distinct break in the theme, in the subject matter between chapter 39 and chapter 40, much as there is a break between the 39th and the 40th books in the Bible, Malachi and Matthew, that the so-called scholars contend two different authors must have written the book of Isaiah over a number of years. Problem number three, the worldwide flood of Noah. The story of a global flood intended to destroy the human race he is rejected by evolutionists, rejected by secular uh, geologists, and certainly rejected by skeptics and atheists. They don't believe in the flood of Noah because they don't believe in the God of Noah. Pastor Henry Halley wrote a great Bible handbook, first published in 1924. Every, every Christian should have a copy of it. It's got some great supplements on archaeology and church history. And Henry Halley was a real Bible-loving, Bible-believing man. But he wrote under the heading, The Extent of the Flood, page 74, The whole race, except Noah and his family, were destroyed. To destroy the race, it was necessary for the flood to cover only so much of the earth as was inhabited. And then he asks, how could one family in 10 generations with primitive modes of travel populate the whole earth? Most likely, the race had not spread far outside the Euphrates basin. So even a good Bible teacher uh, fell victim to believing in the a localized flood. Problem number four, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. The destruction of those twin cities because of their immorality and their perversion is vigorously opposed by the queer and the homosexual lobby in this country. And uh, it's opposed by people in the news media who want to sort of redefine it, reinterpret it. And uh, it's opposed by people who want to be immoral and want to be perverted. That's, the sub that's what it comes down to. Right. Problem number five. The account of Jonah being swallowed by a whale. Critics of the Bible say it's absurd to believe that a man could be swallowed whole by a whale 
and then survive for three days and nights and live to tell about it later on. They just refuse to believe that something like that could actually take place. And problem number six, the seven extra books in the Old Testament found in a Catholic Bible, which are not found in ours, called the Apocrypha. Apocrypha means spurious, doubtful, questionable. The Catholic Council of Trent declared April 8th, 1546, but if anyone received not as sacred and canonical the said books entire with all their parts as they have been used to be read in the Catholic Church and as they are contained in the old Latin Vulgate edition and knowingly and deliberately condemn the traditions aforesaid, let him be anathema, to be cursed. So by their own words, their collection of biblical books is based on their tradition. But woe be unto you if you disagree with them. Now, let's go back and see how the Lord Jesus viewed each one of these subjects. Problem number one. Genesis chapters 1 and 2. Are they both merely allegory? Are they simply figurative? Are they stories that you don't have to accept as true? Turn, if you will, to the book of Matthew, chapter 19. Matthew 19. And notice there verses 4 and 5. Matthew 19, verses 4 and 5. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? That's taken from Genesis 1, verse 27. And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. That's from Genesis 2, verse 24. The Lord Jesus accepted both accounts as being true. This was the first problem I dealt with in my book on contradictions last year. Chapter 1 gives us an outline of the creation week. Chapter 2 gives us extra details that have to be properly fitted into that outline. So that rather than contradicting each other, they both merge together quite well. Problem number 2. The two authors of Isaiah. Part 1 would be chapters 1 through 39, and part 2 would be chapters 40 through, excuse me, 40 through 66. Turn, if you will, to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. And let's read verses 14, 15, and 16. that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Esaias, or Isaiah, the prophet, saying, The land of Zabulon and the land of Naphtalim, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. All that's from Isaiah chapter 9. That, that would be the first part, whoever the first author might have been. Turn also to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. And verses 17 and 18. Matthew 12, 17 and 18. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Esaias the prophet, saying, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. That's from Isaiah 42, verse 1. That would be in the second part, the so-called second author of Isaiah. But the Lord Jesus said both of these statements originated from the mouth of Isaiah. He's the one responsible for both. We might say, who am I to question the Lord? Who am I to argue with God? If it's good enough for Jesus Christ, it's good enough for me. Problem number three. The global flood. Yes or no? The global flood. 
Turn, if you will, to Luke chapter 17. Luke 17. And let me call your attention to verses 26 and 27. Luke 17, verses 26 and 27. Christ said, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. The Lord Jesus took the story of Noah's great flood to be a fact. And it was believed by the Jews who were hearing him preach at the time. Moses' account says, And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Genesis 7, 19. It wasn't simply a localized flood where people were dwelling. Pastor Halley had it wrong in his book. And the flood didn't just destroy man where he had traveled and settled and no farther. Genesis 7, verses 21 and 22. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beast and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land, died. God wasn't simply interested in destroying man. He had intended to destroy everything that lived. That's why he, told, he, he sent two of each kind to Noah to get into that ark. But every, every, the rest of them were all wiped out. From the creation of Adam to the time of Noah's three sons was 1,565 years. 1,565 years. If you add up the, uh, the lifespans of the people there. There may have been only 10 generations between Adam and Noah, but the average lifespan was 738 years. That's a lot of time for people to reproduce, to repopulate. I mean, if they didn't spread out, according to the Bible, if they didn't spread out over the world, they'd be pretty bunched up together, wouldn't you think, after 1,500 years of repopulating? And let me say this. Herds of wild beasts and flocks of birds multiply in greater numbers and more quickly than people do. Most women only bear one child at a time, where birds have several uh, uh, babies in their nest. Uh, other animals give a birth to larger litters. Dogs have about an average of, what, uh, eight, nine, ten pups sometimes. Cats, about four, five, six sometimes. Animals reproduce in greater numbers and, and in greater frequency than people do. And those animals aren't going to stick around and stay in one localized area. They're going to travel wherever the food can be found. But um, observable evidence testifies of a global flood. I've mentioned this to you before. The Grand Canyon is a great example. You can go there and see the different layers of sediment deposited. But go all around the world and look at any mountain range you want to name. And if, and if the lighting is right, the sunlight is right, or if there's a light snowfall that happened to just have fallen on, that, on those mountains, you can see the striations go horizontally, suggesting that everything was once underwater. And then as the water assuaged, it laid down the sediment deposits as we see them today. I don't know why people have a hard time with that, why geologists want to deny what they see right in front of them, but they do. And not only that, but the world's population also testifies to a flood. There are seven and a half billion people in the world right now, 2018. In 1990, there were five billion people in the world. In 1980, there were 3.5 billion people in the world. In 1950, there were only 2.5 billion people estimated in the world. In 1870, there was only 1 billion people 
there were, there were rather there were only one billion people estimated to be in the entire world. And when you go back to the time of Christ, there were only about 400 million people in the entire world at the time of Christ. And you can get on the internet and, and type in world population and uh, world or, or population growth. And you'll find a chart that curves down backwards, but it can't go back any farther than 4,500 years from now. Exactly when Noah's flood would have occurred, according to the Bible's narrative. So you want to ask an atheist, you don't believe in the flood of Noah, and I, I understand that because you don't believe in the God of Noah, correct? And of course they're going to have to agree. Well, if modern man, homo sapiens as, as we're called, has been around and has been reproducing at some, you know, standard rate for a hundred thousand years, where did everybody go? There should be a hundred billion people in this world right now. And just simply from the time of Adam until now, if there was no flood, there should be close to 50 billion people in the world right now, but there's not. So where did everybody go? What happened to the population? Something happened 4,500 years ago that started things uh, once again. It restarted the population growth, and it began with Noah and his three sons and their wives. Until we have 7.5 billion today, 2018. Why that escapes people, I don't know. Why they ignore what they see before them? The skeptic denies the entire story of the flood. But if Jesus accepted a global flood, so do we. All right? All right, we move on to problem number four. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Turn, well, you're still there, Luke 17. Notice the next two verses, verses 28 and 29. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. In verse 30, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. You know, despite the objections by the vocal queer groups in the world, the sodomites and the homosexuals and the perverts, um, and the rejection by the, the plain story by liberal scholars and liberal ministers, the Lord Jesus took it to be a factual story. He accepted it as fact. And I got to tell you, Christ had inside information because he was God in the flesh. He knew whether or not those, those cities had been wiped out. He did it. He should have known. And if he's our example, we have to agree with him. Despite the protests, beside, despite the political correctness of the age in which we live. Ezekiel 16 and verse 49. You don't need to turn, but you can write this reference down. says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor, and needy. The gays want to say, see, see, Sodom's sin wasn't immorality, but it was in not being hospitable uh, and kind to others. That was their sin. Well, that actually makes life more dangerous and more perilous because it, it, it implies that God is willing to wipe out your entire town if it's not kind. What kind of garbage thinking is that? The next verse, Ezekiel 16, verse 50, says, However, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. Leviticus, Leviticus 18, 22 states, And thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. They were perverts. They were faggots. And you know something? We're going to have to use the word pervert and deviant and queer and faggot as often as we can before the thought police and the political correctness police come along and try to shut us down. I mean, for all we know, this, this might be edited by YouTube. 
You don't have freedom of speech anymore to say what clearly needs to be said. But their sin began with pride, just like the men in Romans chapter 1, verse 21, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And then pride led them to commit greater sins, thinking they could get away with it. Ecclesiastes 8, verse 11 says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. You get away with one sin for a while, and you think, no harm has been done, no consequence is on its way, so you try to commit another sin. The flesh of man is never satisfied. It always wants to gravitate to whatever lowest common denominator, whatever perverted act it thinks it can get away with, whatever self-abusing sin, whether it's alcohol, drugs, or immorality, you name it, and thinks there's not going to be any consequence or any price to pay. But the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. You're going to pay a price for what you do uh, in this life. But God destroyed Sodom for its perversion, and Christ accepted it as a fact. A problem number five, was Jonah really swallowed by a whale? I know it's a fanciful story, and it sounds like something is simply made up for some children's storybook. But according to Christ, he was. Notice Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40. Matthew 12 and verse 40. Jesus said, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The Lord Jesus believed the story of Jonah, and he believed it to be true, and he used it to predict his own burial in the tomb and his resurrection. We mention it uh, usually at Easter time because everybody's got a bad chronology of the last week of Jesus, and they say Jesus was died on Friday, rose on Sunday, and maybe a day and a half, but there's sort of three days are sort of involved. Uh, but nobody says Jonah was only in the whale's belly from Friday to early Sunday morning. That's how you'd have to reinterpret it in order to match the, the misinterpretation of Christ's timeline. Someone might ask, isn't the story just too preposterous, it's too improbable, too unlikely to be true? There's actually a story of James Bartley. James Bartley was a crew member on a, whaling, a British whaling vessel called the Star of the East. And they were in South America off the Falkland Islands. And in February of 1891, Mr. Bartley went overboard and went right down hole into the throat of a sperm whale. And some time went by, the crew members figured he's lost forever. And they harpooned a whale and lugged it up onto the deck of the ship and began to slice and dice the, the whales and cut them into pieces as they do. And they got to the stomach lining and they saw the imprint of a man inside that stomach lining. And they figured if this was Bartley, this, surely he's dead by now. And they carefully cut away that membrane. And Mr. Bartley was unconscious, but he was still alive after nearly four days. You can look it up on the internet. So a real life, a modern day Jonah actually had a story to tell. You know, we talk about fish stories. Well, I caught one that was this big, you know, and it actually, <laughs> whoops. That guy had a fish story that would beat anybody's fish story. And the captain of the vessel and all the other crew members uh, swore to its truthfulness and is reported widely in newspapers here in America and in Great Britain. But if the Lord Jesus believed the story of Jonah to be true, so do we. That's all I need to know. If Jesus believed it, I believe it. Now, problem number six, lastly, what about the Apocrypha, the extra books that are contained in a Catholic Bible that we don't have in our Bible? You know, the Jews reject those Apocrypha books. So do Protestants. So do Bible believers. But what did the Lord Jesus say? Did he say anything along these lines? Turn now to the book of Matthew, chapter 23. 
Matthew chapter 23. And notice there verses 34 and 35. Matthew 23, verses 34 and 35. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Berechias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. The Jews have always recognized the same 39 books in their scriptures, our, our Old Testament, that we do. The chief difference being the, the order in which they place them. The Jews arrange their books beginning with Genesis, and they conclude with Second Chronicles. Our Old Testament ends with Malachi, but it's the same 39 books in both cases. Here, Christ outlined the scriptures when he said Abel, that's from Genesis chapter 4, and then he said Zacharias, that's from 2 Chronicles 24. He outlined the canon of the Old Testament scriptures with no apocrypha. And lastly, Turn, if you will, to Luke 24, Luke 24, and um, we'll read one verse there, and that's going to be verse, verse 44. Luke 24 and verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms, concerning me. The Lord Jesus said the Hebrew Scriptures, or our Old Testament, comprised 39 books, and that they were divided into three categories. The Law, those would be the first five books of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms, or the Writings. This is how every Jew divides his Scriptures today with no apocrypha allowed. The Lord agreed with the Jews. The Lord agreed with the Protestant interpretation of the Reformation, and he rejected the Roman Catholic position, adding those extra books. So when the Council of Trent said in 1546, if anyone rejects these books or these traditions, let him be accursed, that made them the only so-called Christian church in, the hist in history who has officially cursed Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ rejected those books. He outlined the canon for his listeners. And I'm going to begin to close right here. The Lord Jesus said, John 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of of life. And lastly, let me say, when it comes to a contest between Jesus and the opinions of modern scholarship, bet on the Lord Jesus every time. <laughs>